Good morning, friends. This is Sean, Sean Downs, Sean for Science from the Passaic Institute, and today is a great day to talk mathematics. Today, we're going to be digging into the inner workings, the kind of inside structure, the nuts and bolts, the guts of vector spaces. So let's get started. When I was a young undergraduate in physics and first decided that I wanted to learn math, I cracked open a book on abstract algebra. And one of the things that caught my eye, one of the first ideas that really had an effect on me was the definition of a vector space as a field action on an abelian group. All these years later, it turns out that this definition really can inform a lot of our work, uh, understanding representation theory and, and uh, various symmetry groups in physics and so on. So I thought it's worth discussing. Okay, so let's unpack that definition a little bit. So a field, you might recall, is a sum set with um, two operations, addition and multiplication, and they're really well behaved. So they're associative and they're commutative and they distribute amongst each other. They have inverses and identity elements. Uh, and an abelian group is just a set that has one of those operations. So let F be a field and let A be an abelian group. A field action of F on A is a map from the Cartesian product of F times A into A that satisfies uh, a few consistency conditions, if you like. So let's call those consistency conditions the conditions of scalar multiplication. First is that the multiplicative identity of the field should act as the identity map on the abelian group itself. <laughs> the second is a distributivity condition uh, of scalar multiplication across um, the abelian group's notion of addition. Um, and then the last two conditions are kind of an alignment between um, addition of the field and the abelian group and scalar multiplication and field multiplication. So my instinct as an undergraduate was to take this definition as a kind of constructive one and try to reverse engineer it. I don't know if this was the physics education or what. So I thought, okay, so given a vector space and given a field, how can I determine what the abelian group was? And this turned out to be a really bad instinct, not just for this particular case, but for the study of algebra in general. And I think sometimes the definitions in, especially in category theory, tend to be really circular and become difficult for <laughs> at least a stumbling block conceptually for a lot of us newcomers to the field to understand. Um, and so let's illustrate why that instinct is bad a little bit um, now. So let's consider the vector space Rn. Now, what is the abelian group? for the vector space Rn? Well, as a matter of fact, it's Rn, <laughs> the Cartesian product, the n-fold Cartesian product of the real numbers, um, together with the operation of addition, which is defined kind of component-wise um, in, in the n-tuples. That didn't feel very enlightening to a young physicist, but as you can see, what it effectively did was generalize the structure of the abelian group defined over Rn to, to the full-blown vector space. And to really appreciate that, um, I had to kind of think about it in terms of other fields that might act on that abelian group. So let's think of, instead of the reals acting on Rn uh, plus, let's think of the rationals. So this is something that you might find in a physics problem when you study, say, um, crystals, a crystal lattice in, say, R3. So um, in this case, you really are only interested in kind of discrete translations, um, transformations. So you know, integers or some fractions um, of wavelengths between points, fixed points in space. So in this case, really, you've effectively just kind of reduced the structure of your vector space to kind of q to the n or q3 in, in this particular case but the definitions carry through you know nevertheless in other words when we talk about scalar multiplication we can only really multiply by rational numbers so um so you can get a sense for how the definition might not be terribly constructive um to further understand and probe our understanding of how these field actions work, this scalar multiplication, let's consider changing the field out to something uh, a little bit more general, like the complex numbers. So what is a field action of C on the abelian group Rn with addition? So you can imagine taking a complex number Z and some element of the abelian group A and multiplying them by each other. That's uh, fairly intuitive. But in terms of the map, in terms of scalar multiplication, z times a does not give you a member of Rn. So you have to find a way to, to complete that mapping. So one naive thing that you might try to do is just take the real part. 
<laughs> of that map uh, truncate, in other words, the answer. So the real part of Z times A and say, okay, well, that's the map to A. But you run into trouble when you start trying to verify this definition across the other rules of scalar multiplication. You can see how the alignment of scalar multiplication in this context fails when we have two items, say Z times Z bar acting on A. That is a real number times a, which seems fine, but it's also different than, say, the real part of z squared acting on a. In other words, you get a contradiction, so it doesn't fully work. So something is, is definitely wrong here. You can try to fix this in a matter of speaking by instead of having a c action on rn, you can try a c action on r to the 2n. And I'll leave that as an exercise for you to kind of to kind of unpack and, and figure out. But immediately you can kind of see how um, since R2 is a vector space isomorphic to Cn, this is a little bit more intuitive and gets us to the, an important notion of dimension of a vector space. OK, so that, that kind of brings us to the question of like, what are we even doing? <laughs> like, what is the point of this? What are vector spaces used for? Why do we like them? And what um, features of the vector space are we really after here? Thinking again as a physicist, but or, you know, or a statistician or anyone else, kind of the most important thing is linearity, the concept of linear independence, the concept of having a basis um, of vectors that we can use to kind of organize our information. And then, of course, linear operators and the simplicity of linear spaces is, is uh, a close second. Additionally, these, these things are used for representations of symmetry groups and pop up all the time, again, in physics or, or whatever. So, but really, how much of that structure that we've just elaborated on that we want is part of a vector space is related to a field action on an abelian group? Well, it turns out, not much. <laughs> These properties belong to objects that are slightly more abstract in nature, namely modules over rings. So let's remind ourselves that a ring is a set with two operations, one of which is really well behaved, like an abelian group, and the other of which need not be. I mean, sure, it's associative, but it doesn't need to have inverses, it doesn't need to have an identity, uh, and it doesn't need to commute at all. But, you know, the multiplication will still need to distribute uh, across addition and so on. For our purposes today, we're going to consider unital rings, rings with a one. We're going to enforce that requirement of having a multiplicative uh, identity element. Um, but we won't worry so much about commutivity. So in other words, we have to specify our action of multiplication as being on the left or being on the right because it's a binary operation. So a module over a ring is a ring action on an abelian group, much like, like scalar multiplication. In fact, it satisfies the same axioms, the same rules as scalar multiplication. Although note, we're implicitly using the unital element um, of the ring here to carry that through. But you can just knock that particular requirement off and still get a perfectly fine module. <laughs> a module that respects that, that unit element axiom of scalar multiplication is called a unitary module. So already at this point, we can start talking about linear independence. We can start talking about linearity. We can start talking about having a basis for this particular space, for this module. Indeed, given a unital ring R, there is a theorem that states that any unitary R module that is R module isomorphic to kind of an n-fold or uh, Cartesian product of copies of the ring itself, that unital ring, um, has a non-zero basis. That sounds a lot like our vector space of the reals to the n, doesn't it? OK, so what is the difference between these kinds of unitary modules that have a basis and a vector space? Well, one, uh, inverse elements. The ring need not have inverse elements, whereas the field does. Two, commutivity. Elements of the field commute, but elements of the ring need not commute. So inverses are great when you want to talk about things like orthonormality and comparing vectors across each other. Say if you want to discuss things like an inner product or whatever. E even in quantum mechanics where we're not really interested necessarily in the normalization of a vector per se, we're usually talk about rays in a given Hilbert space, so it's kind of like a projective thing. You still need to be able to compare two vectors against each other. So this concept of an inverse, this concept of a norm is still really important. Uh, a unital ring... <laughs> that has inverse elements is called a division ring, of which the reals are a great example, but so are the complex numbers, and notably for our case here, the quaternions, which, whose multiplication is not commutative, but everything else still holds through. 
So now let's deal with commutivity in vector spaces. Commutivity at this point feels like kind of an indulgence because it doesn't really do much for us other than, you know, knock out the quaternions from our possible uh, field action axioms. But the question is, so is commutivity truly necessary for discussing a vector space? And in fact, this turns out to be a matter of cultural opinion. Some texts will define like a left vector space over a unitary D module where D is a division ring. So notably including the quaternions in this space. Uh, and there the multiplication, the scalar multiplication need not commute. So looking back on our definition of scalar multiplication, we see that commutivity is not required explicitly anywhere. The commutivity of um, multiplication in the vector space is inherited directly from the field structure. So everything goes through just fine with uh, division rings instead of fields. Um, so hopefully that settles that. Commutivity is not required for defining a vector space, although it might be recommended in many contexts. Now, scalar multiplication in this context looks a lot like operators acting on a vector space, like, for example, unitary operators acting on a, on a representation of a symmetry group. So affording non-commutative rings like the quaternions feels really natural in this respect. Next time, we'll see how this structure persists when we add on even more structural demands of our vector space, say, like an inner product. But that's all for today. Have a great day, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.